um, from our uh, our last meeting uh, on July 13th and had a chance to take a look at them. Um, on, are there any comments or questions um, or corrections or edits that anyone would like to, uh, <coughs> to propose? There were a couple areas that were highlighted in yellow. Is, is that are yeah. those questions? And so we'll start off with some uh, COVID updates. So uh, in Fairfield, we're at 724 cases as of today. Uh, since the last report last month, uh, that's an increase of 67 cases over the last month. Um, that does represent uh, some influence from uh, a data dump uh, by one of the reporting labs on 724 um, had dumped to the state uh, due to a lag in reporting, but they sent in, the, you know, it was like 554 cases to the state. And because one of the facilities in our town happens to use that lab, um, it, it added, you know, 26 of cases just from that. Um, a lot of those were, went back into June, but it did impact our numbers a little bit. Um, if you've been following the, the, um, seven-day average of new cases you can see um, that there's a you know a sharp increase there and then for seven days it stayed higher and then after that it kind of drops back down um, and and it goes back to sort of the normal trend line that you would expect um, but so um, we still are at 145 deaths our uh, reproductive rate for Connecticut is is going down uh, got Depending on which uh, site you were looking at, it went up to like 1.08, and now it's down to um, uh, 0.94, so it's going in a positive direction. Um, um, right now we're at, um, so it, 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 some of these variables um, are reported from different sources, um, so there's some difference between them. So for example, the state released um, the first of their um, indicators for school reopening. So they put out uh, um, addendum uh, four, which we'll talk about later, which is the indicators um, that talks about what what um, what indicators the school the state will be looking at to guide school systems and health departments in in 
making decisions about schools, and the predominant one is uh, the leading indicator is new new COVID cases, uh, a seven day average per hundred thousand. And so they initially released the for Connecticut was two cases, uh, two was the average of a, you know two cases per hundred thousand was the seven day average. Where Fairfield County has two point five. The second indicator that they talked about is a percent positivity, percent test positivity. So that's people going to get tests. How many of those come back positive? For Connecticut, that's at 1.0. Um, and Fairfield County, that's at 1.4. And so that's pretty consistent with what some of the national statistics have. There's, there's a few more there in terms of COVID hospitalization admissions, uh, seven day average per 100,000 and percent COVID like uh, illness at the hospital EB visits. Um, and so both those numbers are, you know, a point zero point four and one point three respectively for Connecticut and point six and one point eight for Fairfield County. Um, so while those do all um, uh, as far as the indicators, um, they fall within the category in this addendum four of favors favors in person learning whereas there's three categories allowed favors in person learning favors uh um hybrid model and favors remote learning um the indicators do do at this point uh and that's just last week's indicators we'll see what happens what what happens over the next few weeks and we'll see what trend is going on there um so we'll be looking at that over the next uh Few weeks as we move closer to the uh, start of the school year. Um, as many of you know, the um, superintendent is proposing a hybrid model um, based upon uh, some of the input. So there's these um, leading indicators and secondary indicators, then there's additional considerations. And the additional considerations is really where um, Fairfield uh, is, the superintendent is saying that we, you know, we're not meeting all the requirements in the additional considerations aspect of it. Um, and so he's, he's proposing uh, this hybrid model in terms of, and the difficulty is, you know, trying to maintain six feet of separation um, in the school system. And so um, that, that's the difficulty uh, that they're, the challenge that they're presented with and, and the, uh, one of the reasons they're going, proposing the hybrid. It, we'll see what the board is considering this tomorrow and the board uh, may choose otherwise, but um, so that's uh, where we are with that. Just in terms of we've been trying to crunch some numbers for Fairfield specifically to see if we're um, uh, in any way off. I mean, the, the addendum four uh, that the state put out specifically says that you know, you're not supposed to look at local indicators because they're because of the low numbers of cases that they're highly variable and you can have large swings in them and they're not uh, as reliable of an indicator as county and state data so they're really leaning towards um uh saying that they, that the school system should rely on state produced data for the leading and secondary indicators but we have some folks that love to crunch data and want to see where we are in comparison and the thing is actually conceded that uh, because so many people are interested in local data that they will be producing local data for this as well. And we're looking at for, for Fairfield, um, you know, we're right down around, uh, you know, 1.6% 1, 1. Um, 1. cases per 100,000 um, for the seven day average. We are the hospitalization, hospitalization is the last couple of days we're seeing a trend upward uh, in hospitalizations, you know, where we've been generally um, level or decreasing, you know, so where our, our uh, uh, um, admissions aren't, are, are less than those we're letting out. <laughs> and so the, um, uh, the number generally has been going down, but now we're seeing a, a slight trend above zero where we're seeing some increases. You know, uh, for example, today there was nine new hospitalizations um, seen in the state, uh, excuse me, in Fairfield County, um, which is, uh, you know, uh, taking the indicator up. 
And then percent positivity for Fairfield, you know, we are just at right around 1.4, 1 uh, 1.5 um, in that range there. So we're not that uh, inconsistent with the state uh, in some of those variables, and we all we, we meet the same, you know, that favors in-person learning category. But sort of what we're seeing and what we've continued to see around the country is, you know, uh, there's a depending on again this is, is is variable depending on the different sites that produce models but you know there's really uh you know only you know, five states in the country that are that are trending better uh you know um and uh you know a one two three four five states that are caution is warranted sort of the next level down and then everybody else is trending poorly or uncontrolled spread um you know and it de and again it depends on which variable look at so if you look at reproductive rate um that is trending positively for the country as a whole so there's there are more states that are with the reproductive rate below one right now i think it's 27 to 23 um more states that are the reproductive rate is coming down and uh and get and below one i should say and uh that and that you know we were uh not too long ago at you know two states that were under one um but you know what's going on uh with if you look at the weekly change in the percent positive uh you know who test positive it's you know the numbers of those who are uh in the uh who are trending worse the numbers are increasing far outweighs you know there's only one to three or four there's 16 states that are that are um that number is decreasing the rest are uh increasing um so we're seeing that change in the percent positive creep up in connecticut we're seeing some hospitalizations creep up we've seen even in uh in our area rhode island has gone uh you know, has been added to the travel advisory, um, has um, been trending downward uh, in the, whether they're trending better, somewhat cautions, trending poorly. Now they are, you know, basically trending poorly right now. And we've even seen Massachusetts drop from trending better to caution warranted. Um, and so, but if you look at the specifics, Rhode Island the last couple of days has been trending better. So we'll see if that, changes things but so we've got states around us that in some variables are going trending poorly um, we've got a lot of states in the country that are we see certain variables um, uh, trending poorly and so it, it that raises a question raises some caution about you know um, what we feel will happen in Connecticut now I think we are, are doing well and we need to keep up with these uh, efforts that we're doing to uh, continue to minimize the risk of transmission. And so uh, as a planning committee for the town, uh, as, a, as a member of the planning committee for the town, we continue to stress, um, you know, to, uh, how should I say this, to discourage gatherings, uh, especially large gatherings, whether they be on public property or private property. We, uh, when, when the town is asked to use public land for large gatherings, um, large organized gatherings, we have been uh, declining. We had approved just a few limited uh, outdoor concert series uh, in the middle of June that we've allowed to proceed, but we've declined um, other events. And the reason we uh, allowed those was because they have uh, we have town staff that are able to um, pull the plug on the events if they go bad. And we've, we've gotten close a couple times where things have gone bad, but we've readjusted and moved some of the concerts to larger areas. Um, but we've been keeping an eye on that. And, and while they haven't been without a few concerns, uh, you know, those have been able to be addressed by the organizers of the event and the town staff that are there present at the event. Um, and so we feel like we have good controls in those, uh, but we have um, a fair amount of examples of uh, that 
that I'm sure everybody's heard of, of things not going well around around town at large events. Um, and uh, one of the ones we dealt with and that you may have seen in the papers uh, is we had a uh, uh, 10 cases among young adults um, that we picked up on. Um, and when we were doing contact tracing, it, 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 essentially we came across that these had attended, uh, uh, most of those had been at a single party, and then as we continued to investigate, it turned out they had been at several events together, um, this, this, this group of individuals, and so it really wasn't linked to any one, we don't believe it was linked to any one party, uh, but it was just a series of, uh, of, of events where people were gathering, um, and we're not even saying those events were non-compliant uh, and from the people that we spoke with. A lot of them took, went to lengths to, to, to try and be compliant with the state protocol. Um, but and so we're not really getting to the point where we're saying that, uh, we're basically saying that we have 10, 10 cases associated with people that attended, uh, you know, five parties or so. And so, um, that's really all we can to say about that and so we, we just took it as an opportunity to stress that you know um, that the town you know is discouraging any kind of large gatherings at this point um, and we want to continue to do so to keep the numbers low um, and to, to continue to prevent transmission um, so um, that that event took a considerable effort from our staff we you know had had uh, five staff members working on that just doing contact tracing for, for a good uh, couple of days to get everybody secured and squared away and in the contact system at the state and ensuring that they're all making you know their daily updates on their status and quarantining and so um it was a fair amount of work for our staff um and then we continue to uh um work with and support uh the Fairfield public schools um we've uh been involved in um, uh, uh, several uh, Zoom meetings uh, where we uh, participate. We uh, the school system held a meeting to talk about the planning with uh, the staff uh, that we were on, um, and then also in the same day we had one with the uh, with uh, parents, uh, and so we participated in both those. Um, we've had. Um, a series of questions presented to Jill and myself um, from both uh, parents and uh, Board of Ed members that uh, Jill and myself and others have been going through. And um, we've been, you know, working together on those. We had Dr. McDonald and, and Henry uh, joined us in sort of reviewing those answers and making sure they're appropriate and accurate um, and so um, we've given those uh, uh, to Mike Cummings the superintendent and um, they will be responding and since we've been responding to sort of additional questions that he's sent to us um, and uh, so uh, in addition we've got uh, two new series of uh, webinars or zoom meetings I uh, it's a Microsoft team meeting that have been that have started in the last couple of weeks. One is with the uh, State Department of Education, State Department of Public Health, and school medical advisors that uh, the health department has been participating in. And then a second one that started last week, and uh, it will be going every Tuesday morning uh, for the next uh, um, month or so, at least. Uh, yeah. There's a meeting with State, Depart State Department of Ed, Department of Public Health local health departments and the superintendents. And it's you know, ended, you know, there's short presentations and then it's really uh, a lot of uh, Q&A where there's, well, I thought last week's was, was fabulous. You know, that that really uh, clarified a lot of a lot of issues and I'm uh, hoping, you know, uh, hoping tomorrow's will be a, as good uh, that people have a chance to think about their questions for the week and we'll get some uh, really good responses to things I think everybody is wondering about. Um, so I, 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 you know, did mention that the addendum four to the, uh, came out from the state, which is an addendum to the state, um, 
plan uh, that highlights the, the different criteria. And so that's available now. Um, you know, we did review that and have discussions with the superintendent about that. Um, and, uh, and then Addendum 5 came out over the weekend, I believe, right, Jill? I, I think it was Thursday night. When was it? Thursday night. Thursday night it was? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, but Addendum 5 presents scenarios. Uh, it's a guidance document that presents scenarios of if someone becomes ill um, with COVID-like symptoms if, uh, and, and goes through different scenarios of, of when and where they become ill and how to, how to respond to that. And so it just kind of clarifies some of the steps uh, of, of what will be done. Um, and so we continue to work with the schools. We, in between Jill and myself, um, we, we probably get several emails a day from different individuals uh, within the schools, whether it be Mike or Angela Papa George or Christine. Um, um, just, just questions that we try to, uh, you know, we always prioritize those and try to get back to them right away. Minutes before this meeting, I was <laughs> responding to Mike with a question about, you know, how do we deal with parents who are pilots? Um, <laughs> who travel to affected states and will that affect their children so trying to get back to them as quick as we can um, so I've already responded to that one <laughs> um, thank god and so um, they, then you know to, to we were kind of bored I think that we decided to have a tropical storm um, and so that really had quite a, an additional impact on the town so this was this storm for those of you who you know, you may or may not have heard this was essentially the second worst uh, electrical outage storm that the state of Connecticut has ever had. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been 35 years since there was something with so many outages. Uh, Hurricane Gloria in 85 was the, 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 the leading storm still. Um, but, and when you look at the number of outages uh, in the state for a single town, Fairfield had by far the highest number of outages of any town in uh, the state of Connecticut. We had at, at one time, uh, while the percentages were higher in other towns, the sheer number, uh, you know, so for example, Easton got up to, I think it was 97% out, um, which is significant. I'm not trying to diminish that, uh, but that was, you know, 2,300 customers. Whereas Fairfield had, you know, 60, I think we peaked at 64% out. I saw one report that said 67 uh, today. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was just a significant event with, you know, over 500 uh, trees uh, coming down in, uh, and involving wires. Um, that led to you know hundreds of roads fully blocked, hundreds of roads partially blocked. Um, we had major outages in um, both the residential areas, but as well we lost power in South Post Road Southport area, Post Road uh, Southport Village, um, the northern part of Black Rock Turnpike, the uh, southern part of Tunxis Hill and virtually all of King's Highway East. Um, and so that storm came on Tuesday um, the 4th. And, you know, we had uh, at the peak about 108 food service establishments uh, involved in losing power. Um, we started that night with inspectors uh, driving through town, um, identifying those places, uh, areas and places without power. Um, and then very early the next morning, we started uh, visiting uh, and calling the establishments, trying to make communication with the owners, uh, sending emails to them um, to basically give guidance about power outage. And uh, I mean, we had sent guidance prior to the storm, but specific, you know, general guidance, uh, specific guidance about, you know, now that the power's been out for significant time these are the steps you need to take and you need to call us before reopening we need to witness food destruction and so um, over the next few days we uh, witnessed the destruction of uh, we'll say uh, tens of thousands of tons of food 
are not tens of thousands of tons, well, uh, I would say lots of, many tons of food going into dumpsters and um, being discarded. Um, we did have to close down three establishments in town uh, that um, did not uh, follow proper practices. Either places staying open when the power was out, places uh, reopening while after being told to close, uh, uh, you know, reopening without power, and um, and places reopening and selling food that um, had not been discarded. And so, so some serious events, you know, some serious violations. Uh, um, so um, we are um, continuing to work with those establishments, but by Friday at 4 p.m., uh, all the food service establishments uh, in town had received their power back. Not all of them opened at that point. Some of them, based on uh, the ability to get food deliveries, uh, decided to stay closed through the weekend, um, and some opened on the weekend. Um, but. So it was a, 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 a substantial amount of work for the inspectors, uh, and just adding to the, the burden that we are going through. Um, so, um, and then just just to add, um, you know, sort of prior to this and during this, Eric, we've also been uh, issuing orders to two establishments for what we believe are COVID violations. Um, so one was a, a, a facility that um, that was allowing uh, large lines to form outside um, their establishment uh, and blocking other establishments in the plaza. And so we had to initiate an order for them to not allow the line to create. Uh, and we had previously worked with the owner to try and verbally get them to comply and the owner said well I'm not doing anything unless I'm legally forced to and so we had to initiate the process of legally forcing him to do that um, he has since agreed to bring staff members in earlier to to uh, eliminate to try and eliminate the line before it forms he had a lot of people lining up before nine uh, and blocking other establishments and establish people were going to so uh, We've had some success, you know, I don't want to say it's been a complete success with that, uh, that, that we've, on a few days we've seen lines there, uh, but most days he has been compliant, um, uh, or has been effective in eliminating the line, so we haven't taken it further in terms of ordering a closure at the point. We're trying to work with him to try and facilitate eliminating that, that, uh, that activity from happening. Another one was essentially uh, a, a, an establishment that has two, two, um, two operators in town, uh, all of which were claiming medical exemptions for their food service workers to wearing masks. Um, and the state has clarified that there is no medical exemption for food service workers uh, in wearing masks that uh, if you're working in food service you have to wear a mask period um, and uh, so we we issued the order um, the order neither orders were appealed we, many of our orders are appealed to the state neither order was appealed and we were able to work with the owner to uh, they uh, after some uh, emails back and forth uh, we were able to um, get them to comply. They all, they all agreed to wear the masks. And uh, so um, I think I will uh, stop at that and open up for any questions you might have. Thank you, Sands. Um, I, I know that's a lot and you've got a lot going on. So um, we appreciate the update. Does anyone have any questions for Sands? All right, hearing none, oh, go ahead. All right, um, hearing none, let's move 
to the Assistant Director of Public Health Nursing for uh, Jill for your report. Uh, thank you, Henry, and thanks, Sands. Um, so, again, another really busy month, and I know we usually don't meet in August, but I really appreciate everyone being here tonight for this. Um, our focus in the last month has certainly been on the school reopening, and um, we are following, of course, the uh, state guidelines from ADAPT, Advance, and Achieve, the major document that was sent out last month. And since then, as Sans alluded to, we've ha received five addendums. And uh, let's see. What we were most uh, interested, well, of course, we were interested in all of them, but um, as far as nursing and um, what suggestions are made for us, addendum number three um, addressed our screening procedures where uh, we are going to make a recommendation that parents um, self-screen their children in the morning uh, because of the, the time factor. We just can't be screening everyone's temperature as they walk in the building. The school day will, it's just not the most efficient way of doing a screening. Um, we also have some recommendations for PPE, which I've adapted and you're going to take a look at a little bit later. And addendum number three also had a significant amount of information on the training that is needed for um, staff uh, from teachers, custodians, administrators, nurses. So I'm going to be working um, using those guidelines and developing a training plan uh, for the staff as they return. Uh, we're going to keep the nurses are going to come back on um, August 24th, that's our typical return day, and uh, I'll need to divide the staff in, you know, socially distant appropriate groups uh, so that we can get this training and distribution of uh, material and equipment. Um, the number four uh, addendum was the indicators that SANS uh, described earlier, which is really helpful. Uh, for um, figuring out where we are in the school reopening. And uh, just last week, the specific scenarios are very helpful for um, the nurse in the event of a potential or a suspected or positive case of COVID and what the various procedures are. Uh, it was a lot of really useful information. Um, the uh, the meeting last week, last Tuesday, which is going to be every Tuesday morning until the middle of uh, September at least, uh, for the uh, school superintendent last week, as Sam's mentioned, lots of really good, very concrete information, particularly about masks. One of the state epidemiologists is on that, and um, right now the guidelines allow for medical exemptions but uh, the state epidemiologist felt that there really is no reason um, for students or individuals to have medical exemptions coming to school um, you know he said if they're claiming a asthma or a respiratory issue something like that and not wearing a mask is not going to help them at all and uh, you know if you have that severe disease perhaps you should be opting for the uh, distance learning model. Um, the guidelines also indicate that uh, students with certain um, sensory issues that we see a lot in the special ed population may be exempt, but I really have to look into that a little bit more because that, that's a very difficult situation, allowing one child to not have a mask sitting next to another child who is wearing a mask. and. You know what? What is the impl what are the implications for that? Um, also, <clears throat> in the pre-K population, that would be at ECC as well as our pre-K programs in the high school. Pre-K students under the early childhood uh, recommendations uh, do not have to wear a mask. And I'm sure you've all heard about the no one under the age of two. Well, these children are over the age of uh, they're three plus, um, but that's an allowance that they've made, and I just want to clarify, excuse me, clarify those issues with the state. Um, one thing that they haven't come out with these addendums are specifics for health office management, and I'm sure you have all thought about it. You know, the, someone comes in complaining of uh, 
Oh, a runny nose, which is one of the um, signs and symptoms of COVID-19, or, or a slight cough, or a little difficulty breathing. And how do we manage that? Um, the CDC has come out with some uh, fairly good guidelines, and I'm just waiting for the state to um, perhaps adapt those for um, management of the health office and who we do need to... Um, they, they did allude to it a little bit in the guidelines that they gave last week with the different scenarios, but I don't think it was as specific as, as I would like. Um, so that's it. Uh, just trying very, it's, it's an awful lot of work, and to just get this all ready for the opening, you know, as Sam's mentioned, our team is working all the time, just absolutely all the time. I was, you know, it's part of the job, I guess, but it's, uh, it's an awful lot, but we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, the relationship with the um, Board of Ed and with Mike Cummings down at Central Office has been excellent. We're... Uh, a lot of uh, transparency and communication, so I, I really do appreciate that. Um, the other thing is this week is our last week of special ed services at ECC and at FITS, and that has been going very well. But again, you know, it's a very small group, and it's one-on-one -on -one services. We don't have, you know, 10 children in the classroom getting services. It's one-on-one -on -one speech, OT, PT, behavioral therapy, that kind of thing. So that will end this week. Um, staffing, Sands and I had a meeting with um, the chief of staff, the first selectman's office, and Jim Hasselkamp from HR, and we did get the go-ahead for them. I'm sorry? Henry, I couldn't make out what you said. Oh, you say anything. I think it may have been an echo. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, and they gave us the okay to recall our private uh, nursing staff, I'm sorry, our part-time nursing staff, uh, who work primarily at the private schools in town. Um, my office has been uh, just picking up the work that needs to get done over the summer for the private schools, so I'm really looking forward to having them back. Um, we have been working a little bit with the private schools in um, what they need to do in terms of um, social distancing and the hand washing and the mask wearing. And um, I'm, let's see, I've spoken with uh, Uncoa and I did a tour of Southport School. St. Thomas we're in contact with Assumption. And on Thursday I'm meeting with um, PrEP. Uh, Fairfield Prep to go over their plans as well. Um, the Catholic schools in town, at least the diocese schools, which are um, St. Thomas and Assumption, they, they have their own rules actually from the Catholic diocese, which um, which do follow ours very closely. I don't think that there's uh, much of a difference between them really, um, but just, we just need to review them and see if they have any questions about um, what's going on there. So that's about it. That's about it as far as my report is concerned. Great. Thank you, Jill. Um, does anyone have any questions for Jill? Great. Well, if there are none, then um, uh, Sans, are there any communications? Sam? Sam? Sorry, I had it on, sorry, I had it on mute and I was talking away. But no, Henry, I have not had any communication. Okay. Great, thank you. Any old business? None. Okay. Uh, new business. I believe we have some policies to review and approve. Yeah. yeah and I'll let Bill take the lead on these. Okay, our first one uh, that I'd like to have you take a look at uh, were the uh, policy on administrative regulations for health assessments. And I talked about this last month, but uh, the Board of Ed did approve them. Now I would just like you to take a look at them and hopefully approve them as well. Uh, essentially, if you take a look at that one page in red is the first one. And this is only for the 2021 school year. They're not permanent. They're only because of the um, inability to get this, uh, these requirements uh, done. 
um, by some of the pediatricians in town. Um, so we're asking for um, typically our pre-K uh, children and kindergarten children have to get their um, physicals done within a year of enrollment. So their physicals normally would be due from 2000. Um, and 19, we're giving them a two-year extension to 2018 um, with the um, suggestion that as soon as it becomes feasible for them to uh, submit a more recent physical. Um, we have, oh goodness, we've been able to reach out to um, all of the kindergarten parents in town who are registered. Uh, the nurses either sent emails or we sent email blasts to entire K population parents uh, informing them of this. Uh, we also told them that uh, there has been no changes in the immunization requirements for admission and that students are uh, to be fully immunized on the first day of school. And if they can't get an appointment with their doctors, we will take care of it down at the um, health department at the nursing office. Um, similarly, for those students entering grades 7 and 10, um, their physicals uh, need to have been done since August 15, 2018, uh, and we usually require them to be uh, submitted by the first of the year, uh, school year, first day of the school year. But we have an extension for that until December 31st. Um, again, we've contacted every delinquent 7th grader and 10th grader, or the parents of, I should say, and um, gave them this information. And we also offered to, uh, for those 7th grade students who need to get the Tdap and the MCV vaccine, um, that we, um, we're, we're making appointments down at our office and a lot of a lot of parents have really taken advantage of that, so that the students are compliant with uh, compliant with their immunizations, um, and hopefully will get their physicals in when they're able to with their doctor. And our last uh, policy change would be for the sports um, health assessments for participation in high school sports. Typically, those physicals are valid for 13 months. Um, based on recommendations from SEAC, which is the Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic um, Coalition. I kind of forget, SEAC, I just call it SEAC, uh, Commission, I guess it is. Connecticut Interscholastic Athletic Commission. Their recommendations are that the uh, physicals be good for 15 as opposed to 13 months. Um, we haven't had much of an issue with that at all, somehow those parents of athletes managed to get their physicals in and we've been inundated down at the nursing office uh, with all of these physicals. So um, that's it for the uh, regulations for health assessments. Henry, do you want me to go through the other three and just vote on them as a whole or what would you well, like? Uh, I've got no problems with that. Is there, uh, is, is there some protocol that we need to, we need to do them individually? Not that I'm aware of, no. Sans? No? All right. Well, unless anyone has any objections, why, why, why don't you go ahead and go through all of them and, and we can approve them as, hey. uh, as a slate Sorry of Sorry about that. I keep, I, I keep muting myself because there's noise in the background. But, yeah, no, all three. Can, you can review all three just as long as the motion includes all, approval of all three. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, the other is in addition to our typical medical standing orders, and um, I had Dr. McDonald, our town medical advisor, review this. Uh, just a couple of the nurses actually wanted us to be able to use a, um, a moisturizing lotion, given that kids are going to be washing their hands uh, frequently in the school setting. Uh, they wanted to have some sort of, well, userin available for them uh, to use on the children's hands. We usually use just Vaseline, and Vaseline is a greasy mess. The userin is a lot lighter, but does the job. So um, that's what we decided on, and Dr. McDonald was fine with that. So that would be the only addition uh, to our standing orders. The others, there's no change, um, but you know, they're, they're pretty comprehensive. 
A any questions on that before I go to the last one? No. Um, Jill, I just had a question about um, uh, actually the epinephrine and, and I guess the same could be applied to the discussion about userin. Um, is it intentional that that you're using those those trade names, um, and then does that does that um, you know does that force your hand in terms of uh, being able to uh, replace it with something else? So, for example, we had a long discussion at one point that EpiPens weren't available, and so they were being replaced with the AviQ. Um, right. So uh, you know you're. Um, Henry, that's a good point because I just got my supply of uh, the 0 0.15 and I couldn't get, I'm sorry, that is EpiPen Jr., but perhaps I should just put it as uh, epinephrine auto-injectors because I go back and forth between AviQs, getting them for free, and EpiPens and getting those for free. All right, so that may be something you want to consider, other, you know, otherwise yeah. you... You, you don't have any so I got, actually, right now, all we have are EpiPens, 0 0.3 and 0 0.15. So um, let me just check everybody's stock, and um, I, could, I could just easily change the wherever it says EpiPen to epinephrine auto-injectors. Would that then have to come back to the board, or do you want to make that change now? Can you make that uh, change now? I don't know. Uh, I'm happy to make that change now. Okay. So we can could you just clarify exactly what you would be replacing with what? Okay. Um, under my epinephrine dosage on page two, I two. believe it is. Mm -hmm. Two of six. Let me see. Um, well, I have um, for children in third grade and older and adults, I have 0 0.3 supplied as EpiPen auto injector. I'm going to change that to epinephrine auto injector. Okay. And on the second line where it says 0. Point, I'm sorry, 0 0.15 milligrams supplied as EpiPen Junior, I'll change that to epinephrine, uh, just plain epinephrine. And then two sentences down, I'm going to change EpiPen Junior to epinephrine 0 0.15 milligrams. Great. All right, thank you. Hey, so, Jill, did you have a, a... Is there a generic name for userin? Is that a specific um, type of moisture, category of moisturizer? Well, it was mineral oil-based moisturizer. But that would be the same thing, would you... Oh, goodness. I just lost my screen. Would you like me to just change that to um, to a, a mineral based mineral oil based moisturizer? I think that gives you the most flexibility. Yeah. yeah. I think that was what Henry was getting at, right, Henry? Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's fine. So let's uh, just eliminate the userin and we'll put it in as a mineral oil based moisturizing lotion. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments about this, um, about the standing orders? All right, if there are none, uh, Jill, did you, and there was one more you wanted to go over, correct? Yeah, that's right. It's Appendix H, requirements for use of PPE during COVID-19 pandemic. And um, we do have other uh, protocols for using PPE but um, they are really related to um, fluids and other, um, you know, blood-borne pathogens, that kind of uh, situation. So with the um, potential for droplet contamination with COVID-19, um, I truly just adapted uh, these recommendations from, um, again, as I mentioned before, it was... Um, Addendum 3 from the states Adapt, Advance, and Achieve, and uh, really just put their um, grid um, and, and said this is going to be our recommendations as well, just so that we have it in our, um, in our infection control plan.
Okay, I, I think that makes perfect good sense. I do have two questions, though. Um, yes. So, uh, on the third, the third section, the during aerosol uh, generating procedures. Yes. Should there be an X under face shields? Normally, from my understanding, during aerosol generating procedures, we have the N95 mask, which is appropriate. We have yeah. face shields, gowns, and gloves. Yeah. Um, I thought so too, Henry. I must have, well, hold on, I have it right here. Um, they don't have it. They don't have it in theirs, but I, well, quite frankly, I, I don't think we're going to be doing any aerosol generating procedures anyway. I thought that that might be eliminated. Right. Like nebulizer treatments, they're not recommending that they be done in the school setting. Um, but but there, putting, but there are nurses. Um, there are special ed nurses that may be doing um, suctioning or um, um, or G tube, um, perhaps not G tube, but other procedures that really could be considered aerosolized producing. Yeah. And I can't imagine that that wouldn't require some sort of eye protection or face shield. Yeah. No. Okay. I'm. I agree with you. I think we should put that in. So we'll um, add an X to that under face shields. The face shields. Um, and then the other one is uh, rather minor, but the last one, the in, in care of an individual identified with COVID-19 symptoms. Um, yeah. Did you intentionally want them to double gown to wear both disposable and washable gowns? Or um, I did, actually. Okay. I thought that would be um, I thought that would be appropriate. I have to tell you, we just got a supply and Sans. I took them from your office with these washable gowns, and um, well, actually, I, I'd like to use them for the one above that, uh, particularly during direct physical contact during um, you know the emergency restraints, because these paper gowns that were, you know that we get that we're supplied with, they fall apart immediately. So the cloth gowns do offer an extra bit of uh, protection. Okay. No, I, I, I certainly don't think there's any harm in it. Um, they just make it a little hot. But I certainly don't think there's any harm. I think that they'd be happy to have the extra protection. <laughs> and again, that's also directly from the, um, the Department of Education, you know, Adaptive Events Achieve Double Gowning. Okay, so um, so for Appendix H, just to summarize, we're going to add a checkbox under face shields. Yeah. In the third category of during aerosol uh, aerosol generating procedures. And right. I'm sorry. Did you also say that in the next line, um, direct physical contact during emergency restraint, that you wanted to add? an X in the disposable gown in addition to the washable gown. Oh, um, no. No. Okay. Sorry. No, because presumably, I mean, we have no reason to believe that, I mean, these are not children who are exhibiting symptoms. It's just, uh, it's just an added layer of protection for those who have to do the emergency restraint in the gotcha. event of. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I misunderstood. All right. So, um, any questions? Uh, or comments in regards to Appendix H. All right, if there are none, then just um, can I get a motion to approve the uh, policy, the updates in the policy administrative regulations um, as written with those changes? Also, the medical standing orders. Um, as written with the, excuse me, uh, not as written, but uh, as written otherwise um, with the changes under the epinephrine dosage of, um, from epinephrine auto-injector in one, 
two lines under dosage to epinephrine auto-injector and changing the language two lines below that uh, where it says Epine uh, EpiPen Junior to epinephrine auto-injector and the removal of the term userin under two topical applications CA. Right. Um, with, with those changes and then finally for the third document, Appendix H, uh, as we just mentioned, the addition of the X under face shields. So can I get a motion to approve those three um, documents as described? It's Mary Francis, I'll, I'll do the first approval. Thank you. Can I get a second, it's please? It's Mark Hodgson, I'll do the second approval. Thank you, Mark. All right, all those in favor, say aye. Uh, Aye. 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 Great. Um, any opposed or abstentions? Fantastic. Motion is approved. All right. Thank you, everyone. Um, Thank you. Any other new business, comments, questions that anyone else would like to, um, to add before we adjourn? I have none. All right, fantastic. If there are none, then um, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Great. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you all thank for the work. Thank you, guys, for all your hard work. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank much thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Much appreciated. Yeah. Thank very you very much. Bye. Bye, man. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Good night. Bye. Bye. Good night.